Hello, my friends. Today we are going to talk about acute gastroenteritis. Acute gastroenteritis means uh, acute infection, inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract. So, in very simple definition, this means acute infection of the gastrointestinal tract, the GIT. Now, if you look at the word gastroenteritis, so gastroenteritis, so there's a gastric part of it and there is the enteral part of it. So infection in the stomach part of it is known as the gastritis part and the infection in the intestines part of it is known as enteritis. Now this enteral part again could be small intestines or it could be large intestines or it could be a combination of these both as well so remember that in acute gastritis you can have an infection of the stomach only you can have an infection of the small intestine only you can have an infection of large intestines only or you can have an infection of a combination of these so you can have this with this or you can have this with this or you can have this with this and this so it could be any combination of that but by and large the most common combination is its stomach and small intestine but nevertheless as i said like in many conditions depending on the etiological reason it could be simple stomach as well it could be simple intestines as well now let's move on to the etiology of uh, the uh, acute gastroenteritis so as far as etiology is concerned again there are many causes of acute gastroenteritis. Again, some of the bacteria can cause gastroenteritis. Then we can have viruses which can cause uh, gastroenteritis. We have protozoal causes of uh, gastroenteritis. We can have fungal causes of gastroenteritis. And sometimes we can have gastroenteritis related with other illnesses. Uh, like uh, systemic illnesses. So gastroenteritis, I would just simply write others that are basically other like inflammatory conditions which can cause uh, acute gastroenteritis. Now let's start with the uh, bacteria. Now the common uh, bacterial causes of uh, acute gastroenteritis, by and large, again, the most common, most common all over the world is E. coli. So E. coli is one of the most common bacterial pathogen that causes gastroenteritis worldwide. It has got four strains. So we have got the enterotoxigenic strain. We have got the enteropathogenic strain. We have got the enteroinvasive strain. And we have got the enterohemorrhagic strain. Now again, among all these four strains, Enterotoxigenic is the most common cause of gastroenteritis. It is also known as traveler's diarrhea. One of the most common causes of acute gastroenteritis all over the world is traveler's diarrhea, which is called by the enterotoxigenic strain of E. coli. The enteropathogenic strain, enteroinvasive, enterohemorrhagic, they also cause acute gastroenteritis. They are relatively rare and they cause a more severe illness severe in the sense that uh, usually it is associated with high grade fever it can be associated with blood in the uh, loose stools and with that you uh, the, the child can have prostration as well so e coli by and large is the most common bacterial cause of acute gastroenteritis after the e coli then the other causes are shigella shigella has got also different strains: shigella soniae shigella pexlerai and again, Shigella mostly causes uh, acute gastroenteritis where in which there is a high grade fever and there is bloody diarrhea as well. Then we have got some other bacteria responsible as this, Compilobacter, Yersinia, Enteropolitica. We have got Salmonella and we have got um, Vibrio cholera. And there are some other strains as well like Bacillus cereus, Staphylococcal exotoxin. I will come to the lecture later on. Now coming down to the viruses. Again, if somebody asks you what is the most 
common cause of gastroenteritis all over the world. He is not using the word bacterial cause. He just simply says what is the overall most common cause of gastroenteritis all over the world? Then it is viral gastroenteritis, the most common. This is the most common overall reason. And the bacteria responsible again is rotavirus. Rotavirus is more common in the developing countries because of the poor uh, vaccination uptakes or in some countries they don't even have got the rotavirus vaccine so rotavirus is still the number one viral cause of gastroenteritis all over the world and in developed countries we mostly see norovirus which was also known as norwalk agent so it's now called norovirus and then some other types of viruses like um, enteroviruses they can also cause gastroenteritis And then there are some other viruses, Kelisi viruses, flaviviruses. I'm not going to go into detail of that. Remember, for you, the most important uh, cause to remember is rotavirus in developing worlds and norovirus in developed world. So this you should remember. Then protozoal reasons. Again, two protozoa are very important. One is Entamoeba histolytica. Which is also known as amoebiasis. And number two is Giardia lemblia, which causes Giardiasis. Again, more common in the developing countries, more common in tropical areas where this is more common. Fungal causes, again, fungal causes are not very common. If you find a fungal reason in someone, and it's most probably um, in, uh, someone and a child who has got some form of immunodeficiency, like that could be an HIV child, that could be someone who, who is on long-term steroids or who is on chemotherapy or who has got primary immunodeficiency. So primary uh, immunodeficiency, they can also have got fungal. So fungal uh, causes, I told you, if you find a fungal reason in someone, then it's most probably an immunocompromised child. And some of the uh, other reasons, as I said, gastroenteritis can occur as a part of uh, uh, Crohn's disease. Gastroenteritis uh, can also occur in uh, sometimes in ulcerative colitis. Gastroenteritis uh, can occur uh, uh, in other like uh, systemic inflammatory diseases. Uh, kids can have gastroenteritis, but that's quite rare. I mean, again, by and large, if you look at the incidence of gastroenteritis, it is more common during the summer uh, season and again because of environmental reasons, environment, poor environmental hygiene, poor personal hygiene, hot weather where there are more chances of bacterial growth or viral growth or contamination of the food. Uh, remember, uh, the gastroenteritis can uh, occur. Gastroenteritis again in children can occur sporadically. Sporadically means someone gets a cause and again you can't trace it like from where did he get it. Or it could be in the form of an outbreak where children, let's say, um, you know, a toddlers going to a nursery, getting gastroenteritis, so one after the other, they start getting it. Or like somebody goes to a wedding ceremony and there they get like eat some food and they get gastroenteritis. Some people going to a fast food outlet and from there they're getting um, um, gastroenteritis. So these are known as uh, outbreaks of gastroenteritis. So remember, you can see gastroenteritis as uh, sporadic cases or you can see gastroenteritis as a part of an outbreak. So this was uh, all about the etiology of uh, gastrointestinal, uh, sorry, about of gastro, uh, gastroenteritis. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms. Signs, symptoms. So because it is gastroenteritis, the child can have symptoms related to stomach, he can have symptoms related to the intestines, or he can have symptoms related to both of them along with constitutional symptoms. First of all, if only the stomach is involved, let's say if only stomach is involved, then the child is going to have vomiting. So that would always be a non-bilious vomiting. Remember, the word is non-bilious vomiting because whenever you get a bilious vomiting then you should be thinking surgical reasons of, uh, of, of of vomiting that could be intestinal obstruction that could be intestinal malrotation whatever so on and so forth but in gastroenteritis especially if the stomach is involved it would be always and always what 
non-bilious vomiting. So it's always non-bilious uh, vomiting because bilious vomiting simply means that the child has got some form of obstruction. So non-bilious vomiting, it could be like, again, the frequency is important. It might be as low as one to two times per day to relentless uh, relentless mean that the child is vomiting, throwing up anything that he is taking. So if only stomach is involved, there would be non-bilious vomiting. If intestines are involved, irrespective, it is small or large intestine, they are going to have loose motions, which we also call as diarrhea. So two or more loose stools. Two or more than two loose stools and loose stools mean stools which take the shape of the container in which they go so two or more loose stools is diarrhea so diarrhea is the main feature of uh, enteral involvement again it could be in the form of uh, watery diarrhea what means they are just passing water like stools watery diarrhea it could be mucoid diarrhea when they've got mucus in it or they can have bloody diarrhea when they have got streaks or frank blood in it. So three types of uh, loose motions. Plain watery diarrhea, mucoid diarrhea and number three, bloody diarrhea. Now clinically it has got a significance. A child who is just passing loose watery stools, plain like water like stools, they usually have got viral gastroenteritis. Viral gastroenteritis because viral gastroenteritis viruses they do not cause an invasive illness. What they normally do is they infect the intestinal epithelium. They would activate the cyclic AMP pathways. So there is a lot of secretion of the fluid into the lumen of the intestine, which leads to diarrhea. But there is no sloughing off of the intestinal epithelium, so that's why it leads to plain watery diarrhea. So norovirus or rotavirus they would cause watery. We call it simple watery diarrhea. The same goes for Vibrio cholera as well. Vibrio cholera also activates the CMP pathways in the chloride channel. So there is a lot of like, you know, watery rice water stool. So that also leads to water. But the Vibrio cholera is more common in the in the, in the developing countries. Uh, it's, it's very rarely heard of in, in a developed uh, world. Mucoid diarrhea. If there is a mucus coming in it in, 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 along with the loose stool, that's mostly an invasive illness. So invasive, again, can be bacteria in most of the things. So it could be like some form of uh, strains of uh, um, e. coli, it could be Compilobacter, it could be Yersinia, it could be Shigella. But remember, the more invasive the infection is, the more chances of having bloody diarrhea. So if the blood is coming, a little bit streaks are coming usually on day 3 or day 4 of diarrhea, they can have a little bit of blood in that. That's because of the stuffing of epithelium. Normal, not a big um, issue. But if somebody is having frank blood coming in, it simply means that they have got the large intestinal epithelial involvement and that usually happens in invasive remember invasive bacterial infection or sometime in invasive protozoal infection as well so in developing world you would be thinking of mbbs's in developed world you would be thinking of bacteria certain bacterial uh, you know um, organisms they can cause uh, invasive uh, infection of the intestine leading to bloody diarrhea so again you should be thinking of the invasive strains of e coli or shigella or salmonella or yersinia as i told you that there are different types of bacterial pathogens which can cause gastroenteritis invasive gastroenteritis so that is uh, how you should be approaching uh, bloody uh, diarrhea along with that a child can have other symptoms he might be having abdominal pain so abdominal pain is a feature of gastroenteritis so usually the abdominal pain which occurs in gastroenteritis is colicky, so it comes in waves, it is periambilical or central. Sometimes it might be left-sided as well, but remember, if it is right-sided, then you always have to exclude acute appendicitis. So in most of the cases, acute abdominal pain associated with gastroenteritis would be either central pericolicky abdominal pain or in some cases, uh, central uh, sorry uh, left-sided abdominal pain they can also have fever the higher the fever is then the more chances of having an invasive uh, infection uh, fever can be a mild one or it can be a high one as I told you the more higher the fever is the more the chances of an invasive 
uh, bacterial uh, infection. Then some of the other symptoms can occur as a complication of uh, acute gastroenteritis. So there can be weakness and tiredness. And that weakness and tiredness is because of the loss of body fluids along with the electrolytes. So that can lead to weakness and tiredness. It could lead to headache. Again, headache can be because of the fever or is part of the constitutional upset that can occur in gastroenteritis. Uh, a child may be suffering from dehydration and in that case he might have a, a decreased urinary output or a concentrated urine. So concentrated or decreased urine output can also be a feature of acute gastroenteritis. So these are some of the signs and symptoms of acute gastroenteritis. Now moving on to the uh, complications. Remember in by and large most of the cases of gastroenteritis are uh, self-resolving. They do not cause any complication. But once in a while, they can cause complications as well. So the most important and common complication, if it occurs in gastroenteritis, is what we call as dehydration. Again, because primarily what you are getting in dehydration, the child is losing body fluids in the form of vomiting and diarrhea or vomiting uh, alone or diary alone. So dehydration uh, is a risk. So dehydration if it occurs can occur in three types mild dehydration, moderate and severe. Mild dehydration means that the body weight loss is less than 5%. Between 5 and 10% body weight loss due to vomiting and diarrhea we call it moderate dehydration and greater than 10% is severe dehydration again it is very difficult to uh, you know get a record of the previous body weights and then comparing so usually mild dehydration there are no clinical signs the child is usually fine or there might be a little bit of irritability that might be the only sign of mild dehydration but other than that the child seems pretty fine in moderate dehydration there would be a bit of sunken eyes uh, there would be a reduced skin turgor but still it goes back in within two seconds there would be irritability so these are some of the features of moderate dehydration in severe dehydration there is altered mental status so child must be lethargic or drowsy and the eyes are sunken these there is a reduced mark loss of uh, skin elasticity so reduce very much reduced skin turgor and there would be depressed if a child is very small there would be anterior fontanelle would be depressed there would be sunkle uh, anterior fontanelle so this is what we call as severe dehydration so remember dehydration is one of the common complications of acute gastroenteritis because of the dehydration they can also go into acute renal failure so this is a pre-renal uh, type of acute kidney injury acute renal failure and again because they have lost fluids so again there is a decreased renal perfusion leading to damage to the kidneys uh, resulting in reduced uh, urinary output so that is acute renal failure uh, other types of uh, complications which are quite rare Number one is Gulen Barre syndrome. So Gulen Barre syndrome is a rare complication which is actually an ascending polyneuropathy caused by immunological mechan mechanisms and usually occurs a few days after uh, gastroenteritis. And the most uh, common pathogen which is implicated in causing Gulen Barre syndrome as a part of post gastroenteritis comp is Compylobacter. So Compylobacter infections can lead to gulen barre syndrome later on. So again, not every bacteria is usually the gulen barre syndrome. And some strains of E. coli, they can cause, especially the O157 strain can cause uh, hemorrhage, uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome. So hemolytic uremic syndrome is a complication of acute gastroenteritis in which there is microangiopathic, micro angiopathic hemolytic anemia so there is hemolysis intravascular hemolysis inside the small blood vessels uh, leading to uh, anemia leading to uh, 
uh, small thrombosis and then consumption of the platelets causing thrombocytopenia, renal failure, and um, obviously there then it leads to rise in the uh, serum urea. So it's hemolysis, it's renal failure, and it can have serious consequences. The important thing is it because it's caused by bacteria. Many people think that it should be treated with antibiotics, but remember this is the condition in which the antibiotics are contraindicated. I will write it in repeated words. Antibiotics are contraindicated. It has to be treated with uh, maybe with the hemodialysis, with fluid support and things like that. Antibiotic purpose, if you give antibiotics, the more the antibiotics are killed, their antigens would be released. It would further aggravate the microangiopathic uh, hemolytic um, uh, anemia and um, that would simply uh, can 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 kill the child so uh, antibiotics are contraindicated in, in this particular uh, condition they can have sometimes what we call a secondary lactose intolerance that's another complication in small babies secondary lactose intolerance so what happens is once they get over their um, uh, gastrointestinal episode they might be having loose stools especially when they take milk because milk is digested by the enzyme lactase and uh, lactase is there present in the intestinal epithelium because intestinal epithelium is destroyed it takes a few days for the epithelium to regenerate so for a few days uh, there will be deficiency of the enzyme lactase so that why the lactose would not be broken down and it causes lactose intolerance so they can have like explosive uh, smelly diarrhea with perianal excoriation which is known as secondary lactose intolerance so these are the complications of acute gastroenteritis now let's move on talk about the treatment now the treatment again because you are losing fluids the treatment is supportive so number one fluid support fluid support is very very important so in child who has got like um, mild gastroenteritis with mild uh, dehydration they need to be given oral fluids preferably ORS oral rehydration source because they contain glucose they contain sodium citrate and potassium so that's why it is preferable over plain fluids so oral fluids in the form of ORS diarrhea that should be given to the child now if the child is vomiting usually the question is if the child is vomiting still he needs to be given oral uh, fluids yes he still needs to be over given oral fluid because remember even if the child is vomiting relentlessly still a little bit of things that whatever you give fluids they go down into the intestine so it's important that you still give them uh, oral rehydration fluids the only thing is it has to be given sip by sip so instead of like you know giving a child a half a glass or a cup of water it's better to give them it in the form of what we call as oral fluid challenge so oral fluid challenge is that you are giving oral fluids to the child in small amounts so like let's say 5 to 10 mils every 5 minutes what would happen when you are giving a small amount it just trickles down through the esophagus into the stomach so if you take a large amount then it's going to further irritate the already inflamed uh, stomach and it's going to go come back uh, in the form of vomiting but if you give it in the form of small fluids so there are better chances of getting it retained so that's why it is preferable that in the first two to three hours they should be given oral fluids in the form of oral fluid challenge now if the vomiting is troublesome if the vomiting is troublesome then ondansetron ondansetron is now recommended for vomiting of um, acute gastroenteritis so point one 2.15 milligram per kg body weight is the recommended dose of onden cetron so onden cetron can be given to a child who is vomiting relentlessly so you give a dose of onden cetron you wait for 15 20 minutes so that it starts exerting its effects and after that the child can be started on oral fluid challenge kids who have got like moderate to severe dehydration They have to be given IV fluids. Some authorities also recommend NG tube, but it's better just to pass an IV line and give them IV fluids. So IV fluids normally you would give them the deficit plus maintenance. Again, there are formulas to calculate uh, maintenance and deficit. 
So deficit has got its own formula. Maintenance, you know that for the first 10 kg, it is 100 mils per kg for the next 10, then it is 50, and then after that, like for every kg is 20. So maintenance plus deficit has to be given. Deficit is usually treated with 0.9% uh, uh, sodium chloride, while maintenance, the best is 0.9% sodium chloride with 5% <clears throat> dextrose. So that is the maintenance. So if they are in shock, they have to be given a fluid bolus. So fluid bolus would be 20 mils per kg body weight and that the, the choice uh, of fluid here is 0.9% sodium chloride. So remember if they are in shock you have to give 20 mils per kg body fluid 0.9% sodium chloride. For other who are not in shock but have are severely dehydrated, <coughs> moderately dehydrated, you have to give them the deficit plus maintenance and at the same time if there are ongoing losses you have to replace that. I would uh, you know explain them in some other lectures because they've got like some formulas but for sake of simplicity remember maintenance fluids 100 mils per kg for the first 10 kg 50 mils after that for the next like between 11 and 20 and after the 20 kg for every 1 kg it's 20 mils per kg and the fluid choice is 0.9 percent sodium chloride with 5 percent dextrose so these are the maintenance so remember on densitron and for those who are not dehydrated have got mild dehydration it's always and always oral rehydration solution or diarrhea light and plus minus if they have to be given an antiemetic then the antiemetic choice is um, ondensetron which is a 5-hydroxy tryptamine uh, receptor antagonist uh, we don't recommend any other drugs which can prolong QT syndrome like uh, uh, like metoclopramide or um, domperidone ondensetron is only recommended for the vomiting part of acute gastroenteritis Rest, as I told you, that um, uh, you know, fluids have to be given. Yes, if there are um, some like specific causes, like uh, if the child has been suffering from uh, uh, protozoal infections like GRDSs or MBBSs, then specific drugs against them have to be given, and they are you know uh, metronidazole. Now, as far as the um, uh, uh, let me go. Just give me a moment. Okay, now uh, part of the treatment is specific drugs for specific reason. Now it is important before you start talking about specific uh, drugs, it's better to do an investigation. Now normally in simple gastroenteritis we don't recommend any investigation except that you have to look for dehydration but if the child is dehydrated obviously you've passed an IV line you would look at the urea and electrolytes you would look at the uh, LFTs and you would also do a full blood count to see oh, what sort of uh, if there is any rise in the inflammatory markers and uh, whether there is a um, rise in the white blood cell count uh, specifically here if uh, normally we don't do stool microscopy or stool culture because they are expensive but in specific cases like if the child has got like a heavy blood coming in his uh, stools so then you can do a stool culture and uh, you can also do a stool, stool microscopy so if the stool microscopy shows more than 10 uh, white blood cells per high power field then it has to be treated as bacterial gastroenteritis and bacterial gastroenteritis uh, for that then the uh, cover antibiotic cover from for gram negative bacteria can be given so uh, stool microscopy if it shows greater than 10 white blood cell per high power feed similarly we will do the stool culture stool culture again if it grows some specific uh, organism then it has to be treated accordingly similarly stool microscopy would also show if there are ova or cysts of specific parasites like protozoa then obviously you can treat it with uh, specific drugs like metronidazole if you find antibiotic histolytica or you find GIDS cysts for gram negative bacteria which are usually the shigella or compilobacter or um, uh, e coli then there are specific uh, treatments it depends from trust to trust depends from hospital to hospital but mostly uh, third generation cephalosporins uh, are quite effective against the majority of these strains so IV cephatroxime or cephatroxime can be given in such cases along with IV fluid support 
So once the vomiting stops, once the child is rehydrated and you have given um, five to seven days of antibiotic therapy in case if it is needed, not in every case like in viral, you don't need it, then the child can be sent home with the advice to um, keep a check on personal hygiene, environmental hygiene. And um, that's it. Like that's all about uh, gastroenteritis. So I hope you have enjoyed this lecture. It was a, like um, a simple one. Gastroenteritis is not a very complicated uh, lecture, but still, I mean, you should remember like what are the common reasons causing gastroenteritis and how to approach a child with gastroenteritis. It's all about dehydration, you know, and all about oral fluids. It's all about like helping them out. So if uh, you have liked this video, give me a thumbs up. And uh, if you are one of those who are new on my channel, watching my videos for the very first time, and if you haven't subscribed, then please, 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 please do subscribe. And uh, I like comments. I mean, do comment. And if you've got any question, you can also put it down in the comment section below. Um, I like inquisitive mind, so try, try, try to, to ask me if you've got anything in your mind, something which is not clear. So that's all for today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.